fundraising charity venture give them the ability to communicate clearly and may they be able to touch the hearts and minds of those who are present here. We also pray for unity and fellowship among everyone involved in this event as we come together. Lord Jesus, we trust in your abundant provision, knowing that you will supply all our needs according to your riches in glory. We thank you for your presence at this charity fundraising event, and we pray that it will be a powerful and life-changing experience for all who attend. Lord Jesus Christ, remind us always that what we do for the least of our brothers and sisters, we do it for you. In the mighty and glorious name of Jesus, I pray, amen. amen. There will be a slight change in our program. I would like to ask Brother Jethro now to um, sing a song to inspire everyone as we begin the program this afternoon. Good afternoon, brethren. This, this is one of my most favorite pieces. And it's just a coincidence that Elder Cesar and family actually requested this. And I will try. I've just, the whole family just recovered from flu. I don't have the voice yet, but it's not for my own glory, honor, and praise, but it's for the Lord. love will sail forever, bright and shining, strong and free, like an ark of peace and safety on the sea. by Calvary's love across their soul. Calvary's love, Calvary's love, Christ Crushed and cast. 
us aside and redeem till heaven's promise fills with joy once empty eyes so desire to tell the story of a love that loved enough to die burns away all other passions and fed by Calvary's love becomes a How I wish I can sing like Brother Jeffrey. <laughs> it's not my frustration, but I, that's one of my desire. My, my brothers and sisters, um, it is with great honor and privilege to introduce to you our distinguished uh, speakers for this afternoon. They are my angels in my life. Without them, I don't know what will happen to me. But uh, I really praise the Lord for this real privilege of inviting them uh, for you to know the faces of people whom God has chosen to help those people who have uh, renal problems. Uh, she is a lead nurse for renal transplant services, manages both pre-transplant and post-transplant team in our very own St. George's Hospital, Rhea Fernandez. Can you please stand so that we can recognize? Thank you. Did I tell you they are my angels? They also look like angels, isn't it? <laughs> oh, good. And uh, the other one, uh, she is a living donor coordinator manages all potential living kidney donor before and after the kidney donation. Ms. Janice Tayoli. <laughs> I think I can say now that she is one of my favorite doctor in the renal team. Please don't tell other peop uh, people that. Um, I first met her in the seminar which we conducted. I really uh, admired and respect this individual, this doctor. She is good in giving lectures. And when she talks, you really have to listen because she really talks 
with full knowledge and skills. She is a consultant nephrologist and transplant consultant lead. She is my favorite doctor again, Dr. Joyce Pupula. Thank you so much for coming. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and I am sure you will bless us as we listen to your presentation. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, I'm not sure what we were expecting when we were invited here. But we've gone from accolades, which do we deserve, to appreciation, to the Royal Albert Hall. From <laughs> <laughs> but let's bring us up back home to the purpose that we're here for. Now, I'm not going to bore you telling you about what I do, because you kind of understand it. We've also decided that we're not going to put a whole load of sli slides up and give you a lecture. Rather, we want to make this just for you. So I will say that at any point, feel free to stop us, ask questions. That's not quite clear. And you know why? We've got an ulterior motive here. First of all, we want to make sure that none of you get kidney failure. And if anybody has it, we want them to know what to do to keep themselves well. And okay, if they are on that journey where their kidney failure, okay, it's going that way. We want you to teach you what to do to support it. And okay, if that's not enough, we want you to reach out to your friends, your family, your colleagues to help support them through this. But at the end of the day, what we're hoping is that you'll be so aware of kidney disease that you'll be looking for who can I help? Okay, so let's take it from the beginning. So you might have heard some big words, nephrology. Your elder here has certainly heard that word before. Kidney, where are these kidneys? Most people know about maybe steak and kidney pie or kidneys that they see in the shop and they don't know any more than that. So in the first instance, how long do you want us to speak for? Just myself? Okay, then that way we can go to the basics and build it up. Okay, so the kidneys. How many of you know where the kidneys are? Caesar, you're not allowed to show them. <laughs> okay, so who knows where the kidneys are? Some people are pointing at their brains. No. <laughs> no, although, although, although we know that the kidneys, actually, in the olden days, they used to think of them, of them as being the emotional focus, the focus of the emotion. So not the heart, but the kidneys were thought of as being the focus of emotion. So that's why some people were pointing at their head and here. But no, the kidneys are here, tucked right at the back. And for those of you that are slim, like the two in front here, if you press hard enough, you'll actually be able to feel your kidneys. So the kidneys are tucked away safely. And then you'll wonder, so what is it that these kidneys do? Well, what they do, they do a lot. They take away all the toxins in the system. They remove all the excess fluid. And they keep our bodies cleansed. So no wonder they're thought of as the center of emotions. Because they, when they go wrong, people get very ill. They feel very tired. The legs can swell. Sometimes the face can even swell. And some of you that maybe know someone, does anybody know anybody, apart from your elder here, does anybody know anybody with kidney disease? Or maybe some people do. Or maybe people who have to go on a dialysis machine, you'll hear about that later. Or maybe even you've known people who've had to have transplants. But before they got to that point, they had kidneys not going right. Feel tired, feel itchy, just don't feel well, feel irritable, 
loss of appetite, swollen legs, sometimes swollen face, very sleepy. And actually, it can happen to young people, but also it can happen to old people as well and everyone in between. And it can happen to all ethnicities, be you white, Asian, black, but unfortunately, it seems to affect people of ethnic minorities just a bit more. And um, perhaps we'll get on to telling you a little bit of why that is. So this kidney disease, you'll be wondering, so what kind of things cause it? Well, that's the thing. The kidneys are so precious, and yet almost anything can cause them to go wrong. Common things, but let's actually, let's do it a little bit differently. Let's start from, so what could cause it in a young person? Well, nowadays, have you noticed that many of us, when we have our children, we're having them later and later in life? Well, sometimes we can't help it, but sometimes there are issues with that because we're more likely to have the children premature. They're more likely to maybe be a bit frail and need a little bit more support to get on. And so sometimes when children are born too early, maybe not all the organs are as well developed. And so the kidneys are one of them. And so sometimes when babies are born early, the kidneys haven't had enough time to develop properly. And so as a result, little children can have kidney disease. And sometimes it's because of what we call genetic issues, the genes. Maybe there are some conditions that if it's just one parent that's affected, then it doesn't matter. But sometimes if it's two parents that are affected, and some of you might have heard about things like sickle cell disease, for instance. So if both parents are affected by sickle cell disease and they have a child together, then I'm afraid that child will have sickle cell disease. By contrast, if they have, one has one half, another has another half, then it's in between. And that's why we should make use of our doctor's awareness to make sure that we're at least going into things with awareness. Does that make sense? Because it can then affect the child coming forward. And the kidneys are so delicate, the way they develop, that so many things can cause damage to them. But let's move away from young people. I have a passion because one of the groups of patients I tend to look after are young people. But let's move away from young people because actually it's more common in older people. But often a time when it's in young people, it's because perhaps a genetic problem or a developmental problem. Has everything I've said so far been clear to everyone? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So then let's move up to the older group of people. Say, okay, let me ask you a trick question. I always ask our medical students this. Who do you think kidney disease is more common in? In women or in men? Women? Men? Women? Okay, okay, okay. We're gonna turn it around here. We're gonna turn it around here. So everyone in the room is correct, even those that said nothing. Because when we're very young, it's actually more common in men. But as we get older, it becomes more common in women. Who can guess why it gets more common in women when we get older? So, ooh, who's clever in this room? Yes, 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 because of pregnancy. So once again, pregnancy is a period in life where we want to make sure we're taking good care of our women, isn't it? We need to support them through because it's not uncommon to find women getting kidney failure in pregnancy, but it can be dealt with, it can be treated, but if it's not, and that's why as women, we need to make sure we go for our health checks, isn't it, when we're pregnant, because there's a lot we can do to help them. 
So for women, that's when they might have little issues, especially if they've got high blood pressure from the beginning or if they're much older. But that's not to say, because sometimes as women, we don't meet our loved ones early in life, do we? So it's not to say we can't have the children later in life, but we need to make sure that we have the support in place, isn't it? So then let's move to, so, and then when we get older still, so when we get into the 50s, 60s, it then becomes the men again. It goes back over to the men. So who knows why men get kidney disease more commonly? And our angels, the two Caesars angels, they're not allowed to say. Why do you think the men get kidney disease more common in later life? I'll give you a, I'll give you a clue. Who's been watching the news? King Charles? Prostate, yes. <laughs> yes. Actually, you're not allowed to answer any of the questions. <laughs> okay. Yes, because of the prostate. So in men, as men get older, I'm afraid, I'm afraid most of us want to live to a long, healthy life, but I'm afraid most men, as they get older, they will develop enlargement of the prostate, and it's a natural occurrence. And that's why once men are getting above 40, just like women as well, we need to make sure we're getting our health checkups, isn't it? So the men can suffer from prostate disease as they get older, so over 40, 50, 60. And that's one of the reasons that we need our checkups, just to make sure that's not affecting us. And you know Prince, well, he's not Prince Charles, is he? He's King Charles. <laughs> so King Charles, he thought he was just going in for prostate, just what we call benign. In other words, just harmless enlargement of the prostate. But when they did their checks, they found out that he had prostate cancer. Now, I'll reassure you all of in the room, we're not likely to lose our king from prostate cancer because usually, if it's caught in time, it's treatable. But it can be one of the causes of kidney disease, okay? So you can see the zigzag in terms of who it's more common in. So in other words, kidney disease can affect anyone. So let's bring it home. So what are some of the other reasons why we need to be friendly with our nurses and doctors? And maybe one of the things I'd like you to come up with as a nurse concerned is I want you to think about doing monthly sessions when you do blood pressure checks for all the congregation. Let me tell you why. Because actually, one of the commonest causes of kidney disease is hypertension. In other words, high blood pressure. And that's one of the things that is actually treatable or even preventable. So let me take a step back. You'll be saying, okay, they've told me I've got high blood pressure. What can I do? It's my lot. That's what I've got. But actually, there's quite a lot that can be done about high blood pressure. Now, some of you might not like me when I say some of these things, because I'm going to take away some of your favorite things. Okay, in the first instance, smoking, we have to throw that out of the window. Why? Why, why smoking? You might say, well, it's just, that's my thing. That's my vice. Smoking, actually, not only is it terribly expensive, last time I heard, just a little packet of cigarettes is about 20 pounds. If we save all that up, we can go for a lovely holiday, can't we? So, but the thing that smoking does is it causes the blood vessels to squeeze up, and then the heart has to work twice as hard, and then when the heart's having to pump harder and harder, what do you think happens? People develop high blood pressure. So hypertension, but that's just one thing. In fact, I'm sure none of you in this room smoke anyway. So what else can we do? So a lot of us love takeaways, don't we? And even though they're terribly expensive, there's nothing wrong with having a treat every now and then. A lot of us love to go out and have nice meals out, don't we? But one of the things, what do they put on the table in front of us? Oh, okay, yes, salt, salt. So, and what's the automatic thing that some people do? I'm, I'm, I never, I've never understood this. They've not even tasted the food. And what do they start doing? Shaking the salt. And actually, what does salt do? It, it raises the blood pressure. 
And there's no, there's no know-how, it just does. Because salt, what it does, it causes us to retain fluid. And you can imagine, if you've got too much fluid, too much salt pulsing around the blood, then of course the blood pressure has to go up. So there's no, it's not the doctors taking away the good things. Too much salt is not good for us. Fair? So right away, we can help our friends. That way you'll make our jobs much easier, isn't it? So to bring down the salt intake, okay? And then, what else can we do? So your elder will know, I'm always talking about this. Oh, <laughs> right, okay, come, you're coming up here with me and we'll do this together, yes. Yes, we've got to, I'm afraid, we do have to do our best to keep our weight down. Now, admittedly, it's easier for some people than others, isn't it? Just like, that, like some people have a sweet tooth some people just love their bread and their cakes and their carbohydrates, isn't it? But, and some people actually are just big boned and that's the way they are. But, but, we can all do a little bit better, isn't it? So how can we keep our weight down? And this is all, we're still talking about kidney disease here, you know that, don't you? Because if we can stop people getting kidney disease, then we'll already have won half the battle. So, how can we keep our weight down? Oh, your sister Monica here. In fact, she needs to come up here now. She's right. She's right. Those are the things we can do. So, it's almost like, as a family, after our lovely Saturday meal, I shouldn't say Sunday meal, and I shouldn't say Friday meal. It's Saturday meal for this congregation, isn't it? After our lovely Saturday meal, we can all get up and go out for a walk together, can't we? Or, instead of automatically jumping in the car to go to the cinema, just down there, we can walk, can't we? So it's pretty simple to do. So, we can exercise. Some of you like to go to the gym. Some people, I mean, just think of any exercise. And actually, there's, here's a very good one. Some people like to dance. In fact, I can imagine the two of you dancing together. And that's excellent exercise. That is excellent exercise. So think about what do I like? There's no use saying, okay, well, I'll do my exercise. I'll run a marathon because that's not going to work. When are you going to run a marathon? So do it in small steps, okay? And the younger ones of you, you can teach your older ones Put a little app on your phone. Do your exercise. You know, it's intergenerational. How can I help you? You've always helped me, okay? So put apps on your phone. See, how many steps am I making? Make a competition. Maybe that will go towards your fundraising as well. Who can do the most steps every week? Think about what you can do. So we've talked about exercise. We've talked about salt. We're still on hypertension here because it's so commonly a cause. Even when other things have caused kidney disease, unfortunately, when the kidneys are going wrong, most people will develop hypertension. And have a chat with your elder later. Just ask him about the list of medications that he has. I'm sure he'll be open with you. You know, it's better to try and do what you can do. And he's always trying his best to balance. But remember I said that sometimes, no matter what we do, it's sometimes the luck of the draw, what we're born with, what the situation is, what we're exposed to in life, okay? But I'm telling you what the preventable things are. So, in terms of the hypertension, we should also think about our diet, to lose weight, too much carbohydrates aren't good for us, okay? But let's put hypertension aside for a while, and let's think about it. If we have got hypertension, there's no use saying it will go away. God helped me with the skills that I have today. So even if we're praying to God for healing, God helped us to develop all these medications. So we do have to take the medications and do all the lifestyle changes alongside to make a change, isn't it? So let's move on from there. Hypertension, hypertension. Diabetes, now you don't have to show me hands, but I know that some of you in this room will have diabetes, and that's another common cause of kidney disease. 
Now, there are two types. One type, people are born with it, and it often affects younger people, and un unfortunately, it continues throughout life. And then there's another type that comes as we're older. For some people, unfortunately, ethnic minorities, again, do we all know what I'm talking about when I say ethnic minorities? Yes, okay, good. Um, unfortunately, for some reason, and it might be environmental, because when you think about it, um, the way the different genetic types have evolved has been the environments that they grew up in. And so those, everybody's genes have adapted to the environment that they were brought in, up in, and they have their own natural foods. But when they move from one environment to another, then things change. They're taking Western diets instead of their cultural diets and different things like that. And all of these can contribute to developing hypertension and diabetes. So we need to be mindful, what is a healthy diet? So with diabetes, too much sugar is a no-go. Treats, sugar is a treat. Chocolates are a treat, sweets are a treat. So remember, it's how we bring up the young ones that they're going to continue. That's how their palate develops. So if we're giving them lots of sweets and sugars just to make them do their homework <laughs> in life, they're gonna be eating those every day, isn't it? So, and I'm expecting the angels to be waving when they feel I'm talking too much and then we'll, we'll make a landing. Okay, so diabetes. The other thing is that those of us that do have diabetes, I'm afraid we do need to make sure that we control it. We do need to take our tablets. We do need to take our insulin. We do need to keep a healthy diet. Because I'm afraid that diabetes, when it goes wrong, it seriously affects the kidneys. But it doesn't only affect the kidneys, it actually affects every system in the body. Okay, so let's put diabetes, let's put hypertension aside, but I hope you'll remember them because I've spoken about them at the top of the list. Sometimes, some people are born with conditions that actually affect the tissue substance of the kidneys. Now, when that's the case, I'm afraid there isn't much that we can do so if people come through the hospital, we find that they've got any of these conditions. The important thing is for them to get their checkups, for them to be assessed, and for them to be treated. Now, I'm just going to mention a few of those because, once again, I think you can not only help the people in this room, your family, but even your friends, colleagues, and people in the community. So there are those that are driven from the immune system do any of you in the room, apart from the nurses and the doctors, know any immune-driven disease? Crohn's, that's a good one. That's a good one. So Crohn's affects predominantly the gastrointestinal system, but it can also affect the kidneys as well, because almost anything can eventually affect the kidneys. And sometimes even the medications that we have to use for certain diseases, if we're not working together with the doctors and nurses, they can actually end up being toxic. Or if we find a friend, oh, I heard you have back pain. Um, what did you use? And then they bring out their anti-inflammatory drugs, which by the way are very good for pain, but are very bad for kidneys. And when we say anti-inflammatory, we're talking about those drugs like Voltrol, Ibuprofen, oh, so you know them, good. We don't like them in the kidney world because they, and in some people, they only need to take one and they can cause profound kidney disease. With others, especially if you get used to them, because they're so good at doing what they do for that knee joint. So you're elderly in the congregation, you want to make sure that they're not taking too many of them. It's because they're quite toxic to the kidneys. So, but going back, so what about any other ones that drive the immune system? There's something that affects quite a few of our young women, in fact, black ladies, Asian ladies. Who's heard of some famous people like, let me see, um, lupus, has anybody heard of lupus before? Yes, do you know? Celine, yes, she has it. 
and quite a, a few other people. So maybe the older men, they might know Seal, for instance, um, Lady Gaga. Um, so unfortunately, she has it. Some people, it just affects their face, but others, it affects their kidneys as well. So, and unfortunately, that condition and other immune conditions, often people can just be walking through life. They might say, oh, I feel a bit tired. I feel a bit this. And nobody will know what's going on except that, oh, she's a bit lazy. Or, oh, she doesn't keep up with us. Or she's always complaining about joint pains here and there. But actually, it wasn't their fault. They had an illness that needed to be diagnosed. Don't feel shy. Do we look... Do we look um, frightening, us doctors and nurses? No, no. So don't feel shy about coming to us and getting your checkups. Make use of your GP checkups. It's an opportunity, isn't it? And as we get older, there's no harm. Just like um, MOT, cars, don't we get them checked up every year? So how much more our bodies, isn't it? And sometimes we can make diagnoses of diseases that you might just have thought, I don't feel right. And actually, it could have been something like Crohn's. It could have been something like lupus. And I hate that lupus. Do you know why? Because if it's just left unchecked, and it's quite common, it can just devastate, just like diabetes, it can just devastate the entire body. And yet, there are treatments for it. Okay? So, there are other conditions, but I don't want to bore you with a long list of conditions. What I want you to take away from this are kidney disease is real. Kidneys, we often don't even think about them because they just sit there, top, top behind our rib cage to keep them safe. But when they go wrong, they go very, very wrong. And when they go wrong, we feel it in our entire system. But we can do things with our lifestyle, can't we? If we've got the conditions, we can take the medications, we can work with our nurses, our doctors, we can embody the support because kidney disease is not a condition that just affects one person. It affects the whole family. And so we work together, we support. In fact, it affects the community. We support each other. And it's actually a very expensive disease, the drugs and the treatments. Now, what I'm going to do, and remember, we're going to be here for questions, and sometimes I believe that when people talk too much, people forget what they said at the beginning, the middle, and the end. In other words, they take away nothing at the end of it all. So I'm not going to talk more because I like to answer questions. But what I'm going to do is go on to my colleague, um, Rian. And you know why? Because... Remember I was talking about how kidney disease can end up devastating our entire system. But it doesn't start like that. It goes from a stage one, a two, a three, a four, a five. And at each stage, we're trying to stop it, hold it, hold it back. But when it gets to stage five, it's still not that there's nothing that can be done. There are things that can be done. Ways that people can be supported through it. But we do like to get people at the early stage to prevent it progressing. But even if we don't, there are things that can be done. Ria, do you want to come up now? And maybe it would be better if we take the questions at the end. And you'll see how the sequence of things progresses. Thank you, Dr. Fofina. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ria, and I'm the lead nurse for renal transplant services at St. George's. So um, I'm here to talk to you about the treatments, as uh, Dr. Bafula mentioned. So the treatments for end-stage kidney disease. So first of all, what is end-stage kidney disease? As Dr. Bafula mentioned, chronic kidney disease has five stages. And the fifth stage, which is the last stage of the chronic kidney disease, is also known as and stage kidney disease. And this is where, when um, the, the kidney function is only less than 15% of its normal capacity. 
Unfortunately, there are no cure for chronic kidney disease. But, as, and also, as, as someone's condition pro, uh, progresses or deteriorated over time and reached the end-stage kidney disease, then dialysis or kidney transplant is necessary to stay alive. The treatment will depend on um, the severity of the condition, but for today, I will talk to you about the two main treatments or what we call um, renal, re renal replacement therapies. So the first, the first one is called dialysis, and this is the treatment that replicates some of the kidney function, just like what Dr. Pupula mentioned earlier, that one of the uh, main function of the kidney is to um, filter the blood, um, eliminate or, or uh, remove all the toxins in the body, and also um, the excess fluid through the form of our urine if we have normal kidney functions. And there are two types of dialysis. Um, one is called peritoneal dialysis or a tummy dialysis, and the other one is hemodialysis or blood dialysis. So the peritoneal dialysis is where a patient will have a, a, a tube put in their tummy, and this will be used as the axis for the dialysis. So this is where we'll, we'll able to, to, to put in the special fluid where it will be left in the tummy for four to six hours. And during this time, this special fluid attracts all the toxins and also the excess fluid. And after the four to six hours, when we drain this fluid out, this would come along with, um, um, with the special fluid. And so our patient can do this at home four times a day or also overnight using a, a peritoneal dialysis machine, which will be provided to them. And the other form of dialysis is hemodialysis, and we call it sometimes blood dialysis, um, where the patient will be connected to a dialysis machine. And with this, the patient needs to have access, just like peritoneal dialysis. The other one is a tummy where they have a tube, but this time, they will have an operation on their arm. Or some patients will have a line put on their chest, uh, a tube put on their chest. But we prefer this one because any plastic that's inserted in our body can, can cause infection. So no plastic, less infection. And um, so if we talk about the axis on the arm, we will be, or the nurses will be putting in two needles. One needle will take the blood out, go into the circuit, and take this blood on the dialysis machine. And on the machine, there is a chamber. And that chamber acts like an artificial kidney, which filters the blood. That's where all the toxins and excess fluid will be removed from the system and will be eliminated or, or, or spritted from the machine. And the filtered blood, which is now the kidney blood, will go back to the patient's body through the other needle. Yeah. So this process can take up to four hours, and um, it has to be done three times a week. Most of our patients have this done in the hospital setting, but sometimes there are patients who are trained to do this at home, and they will be provided with a, with a dialysis machine in their house. Um, so the second therapy is kidney transplant which it, because we're in the transplant world, we'll, it's not just because we're in the transplant world, we'll say this is the best treatment, but it's, it is really the best treatment for someone with end stage kidney disease. Why? Because the patient will have freedom from dialysis. They don't need to do this peritoneal dialysis or go into the hospital to have their dialysis done. They don't need that. Freedom from dialysis, better life for all, it will improve fertility, and um, it will be longer life for some, and for the others, it could be life-saving. Therefore, transplant is the ideal treatment for every kidney patient. However, not everyone is suitable for it. But it is also good to know that there are some patients who live normal life with, with dialysis. So there are two types of transplant. Okay? The first one is receiving a kidney from a deceased donor or someone who passed away. Okay, so what happens, the kidney doctors will refer the patient to the transplant team 
and the, and the team will send the patients for assessment, the surgeons will assess them as well, and if the patient is suitable for transplant, then we will activate them on the transplant waiting list. This is the national kidney waiting list, not just the St. George's one, it's for the whole UK. And um, when the right kidney match for this particular patient comes, then they will get that call. That call, that meaning um, th there's a kidney match from a deceased donor. But then one may ask, when will I get the call? Unfortunately, that that's something that we cannot tell. We don't have that crystal ball to tell the patient, you're gonna get a call tomorrow, you're gonna get a call next week. On average though, we say it's two to three years, but it could be shorter, it could be longer for some people. But if a patient or the potential recipient is now being considered for transplant, have family members, friends, colleagues, neighbors who wish to donate or wants to be considered to be a kidney donor to their loved one, just like Nan and, and sister, where is he? <laughs> Who's there? <laughs> there he is. Then the recipient or the patient will no longer have to wait on the waiting list to get this right, that, that, that call, the call, some, some, some people says the call. So, um, so that's, the not, that's the other form, or that's the other way of uh, getting a kidney transplant. So that's from a deceased donor and from a living donor. It is also possible to, to, to um, for someone who wish to donate a kidney to a complete stranger, and we call them altruistic donors. So those are the, the two main treatments for end-stage kidney disease, and I will now pass you over to Janice, who will talk to you more about living donation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Leah. And um, thank you for having us today. Um, in the UK, majority of the kidney transplant comes from patients who died. This occurs frequently in the intensive care units um, due to road traffic accidents and brain bleeds. And there are approximately 2,000 operations that are being done every year, but saying that there is still not enough kidneys for everyone. And as what Rio was saying earlier, um, there are lots of people waiting in the transplant list, and they could go as far as, far as 5,000 people, and the average waiting time is up to three years. But sometimes these patients have to wait more than seven years because they are very difficult to match. And yes, kidney transplant is a life-changing procedure for patients with kidney disease to give them freedom from dialysis. <laughs> Imagine patients with um, renal disease end stage on dialysis. They have to do it for the rest of their life until they're called upon until they have living donors. So it's really, really like all the symptoms that comes with it, like the tiredness, you know, the swelling, and the increased blood pressure, diabetes will get worse. That's why I would say, as Ria said earlier, transplantation is the best option because it improves the quality of life of the patient. Saying that third of all kidney patients, our kidney transplants carried out in the UK are from living donors. So one of them is Nan, who's really done it, but could be your husband, your son, or anybody who really wants to donate. And because any healthy person can lead a normal life with just one functioning kidney. So what makes the donor suitable? So there are three things. The first one, the blood, uh, the potential donor, the one who comes forward, and the recipient um, are blood group compatible. So blood group A can donate to blood group A. Blood group B can donate to blood group B, and it's okay. The other one, they need to be, oh, no, not yet. Sorry, I'll tell you when to move forward. So the next one is they need to be genetically matched. So this is in the form of a special blood test 
where we check the recipient um, does not react with the donor's blood. Because if, if it does, then it's not a match. And when you donate the kidney, the recipient's immune system will just attack the kidney. So the last one, the donor must be in excellent physical and psychological health. And to make sure that they have good normal kidney, kidney function. <laughs> so that one. Because we follow a very rigorous assessment. It takes three to six months, and it could be even more, depending on what we find. Um, living donor workup is like a medical MOT or an executive checkup. We sometimes find some new diagnosis along the way. We always say there's no stones left unturned kind of thing, because it's almost like finding things that can prevent you from donating. And yeah, that will need referral to the specialist oh. team. So potential donors will undergo lots of investigation, just to name a few, like x-rays, ECG, all a blood tests, urine checks, because we need to really make sure our donors are fit and healthy. We need to check the renal function test, we need to check them for ultrasound, just making they have two kidneys. You'll be surprised there's a lot of people out there who goes through life without knowing they have, they're only having one kidney. So that's why we check, because we don't want <laughs> to leave you with renal failure when you donate. So yes, yeah, so these patients, the donors, they'll be assigned to a specialist nurse, that would be me and my colleague, assigned to a renal consultant, just to make sure that things are being checked, transplant surgeon, just going through all the process, basically. What is your medical history? Um, what are the risks? Especially renal failure risk. You're donating a kidney. We need to make sure that your risk for renal failure is being checked. It's not all about what is now, because you're fit and healthy and you're, calm, or you're young when you come forward, but what is 10 years down the line? What is 15 years down the line? Or what is your lifetime risk? Sometimes the, show, the, sh the results will just show there are health implications or the risks are high. If that's the case, then we would not be proceeding with you donating your kidney. Um, we, you know, we would just say thank you for coming forward. We appreciate you coming forward to help try to help somebody, but we want you to live your best life. So that ends there. And it is also important that donors know all the information to make informed decision that's right for them, if you're happy to proceed or not. Or not. Donors can withdraw at any time of the process, even to the point that you are being anesthetized and you say, I can't do this, I just want to stop, this is okay. Yeah, and because there should be no pressure, there should be no coercion, there should be no involvement of money. This is why living donation is purely voluntary. And this is also the best form of kidney transplant um, because the recipient, it, it, with the recipient, it could last up to 20 years. Saying that we've had patient, we have patients in the transplant clinic who has had a transplant for coming up to 55 years this year, or over 40 years, over 30 years. You know, you just have to look after yourself, your kidney, follow your med you know, take your medication sometime, and follow the recommendations from your doctors and nurses. Saying that the kidneys from the deceased donor will be about 10 to 15 years, but this is still great compared that you are being in hemodialysis. Remember, if you're in hemodialysis, you'll be having it for the rest of your life. This is a treatment that keeps you alive. And then transplant is the best form because it gives you better quality of life. Yeah? Um, yeah, so different ways on donating a kidney. So first, directed donation. Directed donation is where blood group compatible, 
and genetic compatible, then you can safely donate to your recipient, intended recipient. And the other one is the UK Living Kidney Sharing Scheme, or what we call KSS. Oh, not yet. <laughs> so this is a scheme where all donated kidneys are shared across the UK. When there is blood group incompatibility or HLA or, or genetic don't match. Yeah, so this scheme is really a game changer. It started in 2012, a uh, game changer in the transplant world. You know why? Because before, you can still proceed to a transplant, but the recipients would have to undergo additional treatments, which can be very tough for the recipient. So you're already tired and you're already, like, with no energy, isn't it? But with this kidney sharing scheme, you can, as if, like, donate. <coughs> it's a living donor donation, so it's much better. Yeah? So the KSS happens four times a year with, where pairs with similar situations across the UK will be entered into a particular run, and then they will try to find your match. So slide, please. <laughs> so this is just an example of a two-way exchange. So there's a St. George's pair there. They're blood group incompatible. So the donor came, there's a blood group A, and the recipient is a blood group B. So that already we cannot donate directly. Thus, we want to enter them into the kidney sharing scheme. So now we have been paired with Belfast. So the way it happened, the, the way it works, it's, it's a swap. So the donor from St. George's will be donating to the recipient in Belfast. And then the donor from Belfast will give the kidney to the recipient at St. George's. So it's a direct swap. Next slide, please. So this is another example because there's lots of combination, because there's lots of ways on how to help people now um, with renal disease. So three-way exchange. Um, I just put St. George's, Bristol, and Manchester, but there are really 25 transplanting centers all across the UK, not to mention every transplant center we're working with like different referring centers. So it's a really vast reach for everyone who has kidney disease. Yeah? So St. George's Fair, if you look at it, St. George's Fair, um, the donor will donate to Manchester, and the donor from Manchester will donate to Bristol, and Bristol will donate to St. George's. So this is just an exchange of kidneys. There's a lot of coordinating when we do kidney sharing scheme because all of the centers will have to decide on a day. Not everyone will have an operation day on a Monday or a Tuesday. You know, it's different. Like St. George's, we have it on a Wednesday. But then the other centers is a Monday. How do we do that? So it's really lots of going and back far, backwards with dates. And yeah, as soon as we locked in on a date, we start our process preparation and making sure that we test again the genetic test this, or in the blood group test just to make sure everything's okay. And then come operation day, we have to operate simultaneously. As I've said, living donation is purely voluntary. You can withdraw at any time. That's why it's important that we simultaneously do the operation so nobody misses out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's that. Um, so the average stay of a donor who's been admitted in the hospital is about three to four days. Some people feel better in two days and wanted to go home. We just say, no, <laughs> wait a minute, just relax a bit. But yeah, so three to four days, because before it used to be like a big, big operation for donors and so painful. So, you know, you, it's really particularly opening your eyes. But now it's laparoscopic, so it's much different. Um, and it's lesser bleeding, and the recovery is much better for patients. 
So what happens after kidney donation? So after recovering from a major operation, the donor will resume normal life, going back to work, obviously with time, and doing what they do most. And also, our duty of care continues. Did not stop, not because you already donated your kidney. Thank you very much, you're on your way. No, not. Our duty of care is still there. We want to make sure that you'll be checked, monitored every year with us or GP throughout the rest of your life. We see our, we see our donors are, as heroes, basically. That's why we want to make sure that we look after and take care of them. Um, so, so Nen, I just want to say in front of your congregation, <laughs> we thank you for giving Cesar the gift of life. You know, it's a selfless act. <laughs> you know, you know a, a true form of kindness and gen generosity, basically. And we truly appreciate you. Yeah. And thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Bring this podium down, please. I'm not there. I'm not as tall as them. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We will have a chance for a Q&A after this. Or shall we take a Q&A now? Right, it's my turn to um, tell you what happened. <laughs> Thank you, Elder James. So, me and Cesar grew up in the same street in a little village in the Philippines. My earliest recollection of him was in 1980. It was a recognition day at school and all honor students would be called on the stage with their parents to receive a medal or a special ribbon. I was in year two, and I was going to receive a medal of second honor. Before we went to the school, my eldest sister took a picture of me in our front yard. That's when I saw Caesar passing by, <laughs> looking so smart in a barong Tagalog. For, you know, during the, International Day, the Filipino male costume, he was wearing that. His parents walking by his side looking so proud of their son. They were heading to school because Caesar was also an honor student. He was in year three. Caesar was invited to come to church by his Adventist neighbor who treated him like his own little brother when Caesar was just eight years old. In Sabbath school, Caesar sits with his friend in the teens class. Imagine eight years old in the teens class, instead of joining my primary class. <laughs> but we spent many years together in Pathfinder, doing hiking, camping, caving. We sang in the same choir, involved in branch Sabbath school, vacation Bible school, evangelistic meetings, and many other church activities. We basically grew up together, doing things together. Special friendship blossoms between us and him, and I became his sweetheart. Aww. On June 19, 1989, I was 16. Sweetheart sounds archaic at this time and age. 11 years later, we said our I do's at the Philippine International Church inside the campus of the Adventist University of the Philippines where we trained. I did nursing, he finished theology with honors. At the age of 30, Caesar was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and polycystic kidney disease. That means he has plenty of benign cysts um, in his kidneys that sometimes pops and causes urine, um, blood in his urine. Caesar's nephrologist mentioned that a genetic variant played a role in his kidney disease. Over the years, his kidney function deteriorated, and at the beginning of year 2022, he was told he needed a kidney transplant. It was sad to see Caesar showing the symptoms of kidney failure. 
He would be breathless with chest pain sometimes when we go for our walks. I had to give him injection every two weeks to treat his anemia as his kidneys no longer stimulates production of red blood cells. He reluctantly agreed to be on the NHS kidney transplant waiting list to receive a kidney at any time from a deceased donor. He did not li really like this idea. We considered bringing his sister over to be his donor, but the process were arduous. Another option was for Caesar to have his transplant done in the Philippines. This would cost around 35,000 pounds for an uncomplicated operation. In case none of his siblings was medically fit to donate, we would then need to buy a kidney, and kidneys don't come cheap. Not like here in UK, it's legal to buy someone's kidney in the Philippines, in the back street of Manila. <laughs> we could possibly sell our small property back home to help raise these funds. So he, he initially planned to go home in the early months of 2022, but Caesar could not make up his mind there were so many things to consider. Our Wimbledon church family, together with our relatives and friends from far and wide, rallied behind him with prayers and financial support. Caesar planned to go back home in the month of August, but his, doc but his doctor said it's no longer safe for him to fly back home, as his blood test results showed he could potentially become unwell so quickly at any time. There's an urgent need for Caesar to have the transplant before his general health deteriorated. He had to be fit for a major surgery. Our eldest daughter came forward to be a donor, but was discouraged by the transplant coordinator as she had planned to start a family in the future. I knew I could not be his donor because we have different blood type group. But to show my support to my husband, I still sent an email to Janice. And I said, I want to be a donor to Caesar. She booked me for blood tests, scans, x-rays. I had a wishful thinking that the blood result would show that actually we do have same blood type. <laughs> when I met Janice for the first time, she confirmed my blood type was different to Caesar and I can't be his donor. Then she introduced a brilliant program called UK Living Kidney Sharing Scheme. This scheme would give Caesar a chance to receive a kidney from a living donor, which was what he really preferred to get. In the scheme, donated kidneys are shared, as Janice mentioned, within the UK. Once registered in the scheme, I would be a potential anonymous donor to someone, and in return, Caesar would be a potential anonymous recipient on someone else's kidney. After a series of blood tests, scans, clinic appointments, and an interview to obtain a license to donate, we were registered in the scheme and our names were included in the July match run. We were told there was no guarantee that a match could be found straight away. On average, two and a half years is the waiting time to find a match in the scheme according to Mr. Google. Match runs happen only four times a year, but God's guiding hand was on the matter. In the first instance, a match was found for us and we were over the moon. A week before the operation, Caesar's blood test result showed dangerous high level of urea. It's a toxin waste in the blood. He required an urgent dialysis. Sorry. I knew Caesar really hoped to avoid this part of his transplant journey. He dreaded the word dialysis, but he was grateful that this was just a temporary treatment because for others it's a lifelong one. He had three dialysis sessions that week. Finally, our big day came. 8 a.m. on Thursday morning, my transplant coordinator with Rojin, the other one, escorted me to the, to the anesthetic room. They were in contact with other transplant center or centers where the other donor and recipient were also preparing for the same operation. It is a well-synchronized, well-coordinated event. Caesar's operation will be in the afternoon. My anesthetist welcomed my request that I pray first before they induced me to sleep. Everyone paused as I prayed. This is my prayer. This was my prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that this day has come. I pray for everyone involved in my operation today. I believe that everything that will happen inside the theater will happen so that your glory may be known. Amen. Amen. Afternoon came. It was Caesar's turn to go down to theater for his operation. He was wheeled in a bed and was waiting for the lift. 
When the lift opened, guess who he saw? Yes, his very drowsy wife. <laughs> I was then going back to the ward. I saw him, but I was so groggy to say anything to him. But I remember I felt a kiss on my cheek. <laughs> my nurse told me in the night that Caesar was now back on the ward from the operation. I felt relieved, at least for a moment. That night, I had a dream. In my dream, I saw Caesar's wound bulging. He is bleeding, I said to myself. I am a surgical nurse, and there's no other reason for a wound to swell or bulge except for bleeding. Then I heard happy voices of congratulations. People were congratulating us on our success successful operation. Then the joyful sound of congratulations slowly faded away, and now I heard sorrowful voices of condolences. I got so scared of what I was hearing and what could this mean that I woke up from my dream. My heart was pumping fast. I never felt so frightened like this before. I cried softly and earnestly prayed, Father, please be with Caesar. I kept repeating my prayer as I was so worried of my husband who was just next door to me. My ordeal ended when my nurse came to check on me. I was reassured that Caesar was doing fine. The next morning, I was determined to see my husband with all my drips and style, whatever. Caesar told me he, want, he went for his kidney ultrasound twice. There's a suspicion that he was bleeding. I did not tell him about my dream. The next day, Saturday, Caesar was sent again for another kidney ultrasound. This time it was confirmed he was bleeding and a blood clot was pressing on a blood vessel that's affecting the blood flow to his new kidney. That's how I understood it. There's a risk of losing a new kidney if bleeding happens after the operation. We've been told this prior to the operation. Our surgeon came to me to say he's taking Caesar back to theater. We'll know better when I open him up again. I really hope I don't have to remove his new kidney. That's what he said to me. He had an anxious look on his face, so I did not ask any more questions. I could see he was in a rush. I sur our surgeon turned around to leave, but then he stopped and he looked at me again and said, you can pray for us. I felt my heart leaped when I heard the words pray for us. In my 17 years of working in the NHS, I never heard of a surgeon who requested a prayer from his patient. I believed my anesthetist must have told him that I prayed in the anesthetic room before he operated on me. He may be the most respected kidney surgeon, kidney transplant surgeon in St. George's, but he recognized his need of God's blessing that evening. We were made aware that our church family lifted Caesar up in prayer that evening. God heard us from his throne. Our surgeon successfully stopped the bleeding and removed the clots. Caesar's newly transplanted kidney was still in good shape. I only spent four days in the hospital while Caesar was discharged after a week, but his trouble, his trouble was far from over. Three days after Caesar was discharged from the hospital, we came to the clinic for his follow-up appointment he was sent back to the ward that evening to be readmitted. His blood test showed his body was rejecting his new kidney and his wound was infected. He stayed in the hospital for another three weeks. Once he got home, he continued receiving strong antibiotic given through his vein to fight the infection. And with the use of a special wound dressing device and proper wound care, the big open wound on his belly gradually dried out and closed neatly. He was fortunate to have a private nurse 24-7. <laughs> Anti-rejection medications and steroids that were given to him allowed his body to accept his new kidney and it started to work. The whole experience was not a straightforward event at all. Looking back, there were five hurdles that could have prevented us from meeting the deadline of the July match registration, match run registration. But each time we were faced by an obstacle, I would tell my husband, there's a miracle about to happen. And that was a declaration of faith, and indeed, God intervened. Two weeks before the operation, we both tested positive for COVID. But again, nothing can stop what God already ordained. Our scheduled operation pushed through. We have now fully recovered from our surgery. I've been back to work for a month now. Caesar will gradually return to work in April. He's been off from work since July last year but he's back in his work in our kitchen, to my children's delight. <laughs> in reflection, what kept us strong in this trajectory of life was knowing the ultimate transplant surgeon in the Holy Scriptures, 
who has once been wounded and now sympathizes with us. When faced by setbacks, we remain calm because our peace was sourced from the faithful God who promised to be, do to be near to those who call on him, to those who call on him in truth. My prayer inside the anesthetic room was not to subside any fear because there was none. I was fearless. I was intentional to take that solemn opportunity to be a witness of Christ. I went there with a, prepare, with a prayer prepared in mind. I was, it was my desire that beyond the walls of this building, beyond the walls of my home, even beyond the wall of my Facebook account, I would take the name of Jesus with me. Amen. My story does not end here. On my first follow-up appointment in the clinic, something special happened. After I was seen by the doctor, Janice asked me to go back to my seat in the waiting area. A few moments later, she came with some of her colleagues and they started singing. For she's a jolly good fellow, for she's a jolly good fellow, for she's a jolly good fellow, which nobody can deny. I had no idea what was going on. In front of other patients and their relatives, she gave a tribute to me, just like she did earlier for donating my kidney. Janice said another patient was removed from the dialysis list because of you. Then she handed me a thank you card and everyone clapped. This was so unexpected, I could not help to cry. I thought, my, I thought to myself, I must have done something good. You see, for several months, my sole focus was for my husband to get better. I did not have time to worry about myself. I just did what I could, no big deal. But it was a nice feeling to be recognized. Janice told me that the person who now carries my little kidney inside him or her, somewhere in the UK, was thankful and was doing well. As for Elder Caesar, he now walks long distances. He even walked from our house in Streatham to St. George's in Tooting the other week. Love can only be measured by action, and Jesus is the undisputed champion of love. What happened on the cross at Calvary was the utmost display of altruistic act of love. Jesus gave his life so that you and I can be recipients of a new life, even an eternal life with him. Let us love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. And I want to say, I love him with all my kidney. Amen. You know how Caesar sang earlier this morning? I want to sing as well. Because I said to you, we do things together. So um, at this time as well, I would like to ask um, Brother Ben, it will be time for collecting our offering for St. George's Charity in, for, to, for the benefits of the kidney transplant patients.
The Spirit whispers peace into my soul In every trial, in each uncertain hour I know I can endure For as I kneel in prayer He enfolds me in the warmth of heaven's power Yet others weep for grief that knows no peace. Where is their hope but in the Master's words? What comfort will He send to heal the hearts of men? Who will bear His love and light into the world? A city on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light so shine, the Savior said. Like Esther in her courage, like Joseph in his faith, like Ruth in her devotion, like Samson in his strength, I will stand for truth and righteousness, reflecting heaven's light. And my life will be like a beacon in the night. For I will stand as a witness of Christ, like a candle in the darkness, like a fire upon the hearth, like the star that led to Bethlehem, like sunrise o'er the earth, a city on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light so shine, the Savior said, like Esther in her courage, like Joseph in his faith, like Ruth in her devotion, like Samson in his strength. I will stand for truth and righteousness, reflecting heaven's light, and my life will be like a beacon in the night. For I will stand. our time now for Q&A. We have to be finished at half past. And we have a smoothie awaiting after this for everyone, I hope.
So um, anyone who has a question? Oh, we have three hands up straight away. Um, I appreciate it, it might be somewhat obvious, but what's the significant factor between a live donor and the deceased donor having such a massive difference in terms of the longevity span? Because you mentioned with a deceased donor, the kidney might last 15 years, whereas with a live donor, the kidney sounds like it would last indefinitely longer. Where did that question come from? It's almost like it's like <laughs> floating in the air. Okay, hi. That's actually a very good question. It's not 100% that it will last that amount of years. But you can imagine when you... Oh, okay. And then we can pass it along. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, let's... Okay, okay. So we'll do that then. Okay, I just mentioned that that was a very good question. It's not 100% that we can say each kidney will last a particular time, but the tendency is for the live kidney to last longer. If you imagine this, who's seen fresh meat just when it's first taken away from the animal, as opposed to meat that has been in the fridge and stood for some time? You know there's a difference. Remember I mentioned early, earlier that the kidney is a very delicate organ. It's made up of the flesh, but in between the flesh are millions of little filters and tubules. Now, the longer it stands without the blood flow to it, the more it's almost like a flower wilting. And so if a kidney comes from a deceased person, like someone in London, the kidney might be coming as far as Scotland, which means it has to stay in ice for that period of time. And so the little flowers or glomeruli, tubules, nephrons, that's the medical term, start to wilt. And when it's then implanted, sometimes not all of them can wake up. And in fact, the major difference is the beginning. Often a time, the kidney from the deceased donor doesn't work straight away. Whereas the one from the living donor, as in our couple here, it worked straight away. And so then the recovery may not be quite as good with the deceased donor. Having said that, a deceased donor kidney is good because some people don't have a living donor. But on average, the live donors tend to last just that bit longer because they've got a better start from the beginning. Does that answer your question? No, absolutely. That's why I said it's a bit of a, um, a maybe a bit obvious, because that was kind of what I was thinking. Something fresher is clearly going to be more, well, fresher food has more nutrition than food that's not so fresh. That's right. But uh, it was just nice to hear the explanation. Thank you. Okay, pleasure. We know that high protein food, they can be stressful on kidney. But in this modern a uh, day and age, there's a lot of emphasis on ultra processed high protein food, especially in the interest of younger generation where we do grab high protein ultra processed food on the go. What kind of impact does it have or significance does it have on the kidney in longer term when it's consumed? or rather at the same time when it's consumed more than what, it's sh what one's supposed to. Thank you. Now that's a very good question. Is there anyone in the room here that takes protein shakes, creatinine shakes, and a variety of other shakes? They're not actually good news. Especially because the thing about these shakes Okay, if someone's got completely normal kidney function, then maybe they can get away with it. Because the tendency is 
in order to get a better and better out outcome, because it's partly muscle building as well as just a quick fix, people tend to take more and more. And the only organ that can deal with these protein shakes are the kidneys. Now, actually, as we get older, the number of the little filters, they start to wear off. And if we load them and load them with lots of protein, we're going to make them work harder and harder. And so it starts to affect them. Now, where it becomes even worse is an individual who starts off with not quite normal kidney function, and then they're being loaded with this excess protein. And also, we don't know all the things that are mixed up. You see this huge tub and they even entice you and say, oh, come on, get two tubs for the price of one. And they're quite expensive when it comes to paying the real price. But by that time, another thing about them is by that time, if you just stop taking them, the muscle that one had been able to build, what happens? Those of you that do it, it turns to flab, doesn't it? And actually, just eating healthily you could probably achieve a better effect in a more natural fashion and save money at the same time and also get all the nutrition rather than focusing on the protein. And I'll just say a quick thing. So the trick that's used, like creatinine shakes, they might tell you, oh, well, that's what muscles are built, built of. But you all believe in God. <laughs> so... How, how new are these things? They've only recently come to existence, so what about all the people that pre-existed? And then another thing about them is that, well, why is it when we take these creatinine or protein shakes, why is it that every single molecule will then go into the muscle to build them up? Of course, that's not the case. So we're stressing our organs because they're having to deal with this sudden onslaught of a powder manufactured by someone who's probably making a fair bit of money. So think very carefully when you go for health fads or the latest thing in town and make sure you're aware of what your baseline status was. Okay. So I have a, I have a question. Um, Kidney failure, kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, are they all, they all the same thing? So, yeah, so chronic kidney disease, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's the term that we use when um, the kidney problem becomes a long-term one because there is also an acute. Acute means a sudden onset. And some of this can be re re what we call reversible, yeah? So, but if in case that the kidney problem, the acute kidney problem is unable to be reversed, then it will become a long-term disease. And that will now be called chronic kidney disease. And as I said, there are five stages, and it depends on the number or, or the, the kidney function. Dr. Popola mentioned about the glomeruli earlier, the little uh, filters of the kidney. So obviously, 100% is the best, but as it goes down, then the, 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 um, the function of the kidney and the, the stages goes up. So the, the stage five, is when the kidney function is less than 15%. And at that time, it might be for the patient with a, with a kidney failure or now end-stage kidney failure or kidney disease will need to have either dialysis or transplant in order to stay alive. That is, that is become or is termed chronic in the one, two, three, four, five, so it's which one is all chronic? of those okay. stages are chronic. So where the nomenclature, where the naming changes is from chronic to end stage. Okay. So in fact, even the, so one, two, three, four, five are all chronic kidney disease. We term it 
end-stage kidney disease when it's five. Because by that time, we're at the end game. And the only thing we can do to support the individual is renal replacement therapy. Or if they choose, supportive care. You're only allowed one at a time, then somebody else then back to you. <laughs> okay, I, I think I'll probably got to ask this one then. Um, you know, sometimes people have kidney stones. Uh, what's the relationship between the kidney stones and kidney failure? As in, is that an indication that later on in life, you know, there's going to be an issue with those kidneys? Uh, that's the first question. I can probably come back again. It's interesting more. because just last night I received an email about a young lady who's developed kidney stones, but she doesn't have kidney failure. But she does get a lot of pain and she is prone to getting infections. For kidney stones to cause kidney failure, it will have to be very severe. Now, if the problem here is kidney stones, we're actually lucky because usually that's reversible. So kidney stones means that either within the tissue of the kidneys or in the tube leading out from the kidneys, there's a stone blocking, and that's what's causing the pain. Often, some people will have them, and they just pass naturally. Some people will have to have treatment. And some people are born with conditions that predispose them to particular types of stones. Now, in those kind then they might develop kidney disease. Like there's one that's called nephrocalcinosis, where there's multiple stones in the kidney tissue. But this is not common, but it can be seen. So kidney stones are not usually the cause of kidney failure. And if they are, usually it's acute kidney injury. Unless it's a load of stones and it's been left, not managed, or they've got some kind of congenital problem. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, uh, let me, I have also a question. You're not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone or young children said, when I tell them, don't eat too much crisps because the, the salt content is too high. And then they will reason out, I'm just gonna drink a lot of water and flush them out. <laughs> Is that, is, that, is that a good answer? Well, whoever, whichever young child said that was very clever. But they're going to have to drink a whole lot of water, which I'm not sure they will do to flush that out, aren't they? So I don't really think that's a good idea. Do you? No. So we won't encourage that. I have two questions. One is, which age we allowed, which age we allowed uh, donated uh, kidneys in the which age we're not allowed. And another my question is for uh, we take a um, vitamin, a lot of vitamin for vegan people, vegetarian people. We always give our children vitamin. This is the vitamin we take, it can affect our kidneys. Okay, I'm going to let Janice answer the first question and I'll answer the second one. So when you ask which age is allowed, it, in the UK, it's 18. Age 18, you're allowed to, one, or to be considered to be um, worked up as a donor. And as to age, there's no age limit. As I've said earlier, we do a very rigorous assessment. When you're 60 above, we do extra tests, like say echocardiogram, you know, just extra tests for the heart. You have to pass all the tests, then you can donate. <laughs> Yeah, there's no age limit, but as long as you're fit and be able to donate, are suitable to donate, basically. And in fact, I think the oldest patient that's donated in the UK was over 80. Oh. But, but we don't usually encourage that because they might have other, but that was a super fit person. And then your other question, vitamins. Yes. Vitamin, so yes. I can, can affect what kidneys or no? Well, the answer, it depends on what kind of vitamins. Let's remember something. Good things are good, but too much of a good thing becomes what? Bad, yes. So there are some certain vitamins, actually, like vitamin C. What do we know that helps with? 
absorption of, oh, God, there are some very clever people here. Absorption of iron, and also it helps prevent colds, or when we've got a cold, helps us recover. But too much vitamin C, the gentleman in the black suit, what can it cause? Kidney stones. Yes, I knew you knew the answer. <laughs> so too much vitamin C, for instance, can cause kidney stones. So, but a little vitamin C is good for us. Vitamin D. Now, during COVID, everybody was dousing vitamin D. Like, in fact, the, the government was sending it out to individuals. But once again, in fact, we had a lady come to our clinic just recently. The cause of her kidney disease was calcium and vitamin D supplements forming, actually, stones and calcification within the kidney. So anything in excess is bad news. Does that all make sense? Let me tell you a little secret, and not everybody's going to know this, but this secret is one I want you to spread. If you pick up a little pack of vitamins, whether you go to any chemist, now if you look at the box, you'll see that they write the percent RDA, recommended daily allowance. I want to implore you to look at that. There's no use saying that, oh, I like a bit of sanitogen, a bit of centrum, a bit of that, or it will give me extra strength. Once you've had your 100% recommended daily allowance, there's no essence buying additional vitamin D on top of that because you'll end up with excess. So that's the little trick we're leaving with you, and it's the secret we want you to spread to everyone. Oh, um, I had a question. It's about the function of the kidney because I had to study it recently in my A-level course. And there's one I see part a doctor of it or a nurse coming on there, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> there's one part of its structure that I've never quite understood. Um, I, wait, hold on a minute. It's the podocyte. I never understood it's past the, the Bomer's capture. I don't understand how, how its function from there. Now that's an amazing question, which I wish I had a piece of paper to do a diagram for you. And I'm not surprised you didn't understand that. I'll tell you why. Okay. First of all, we look at the kidney. Okay. That's what we see. We see it in the butchers. We see it everywhere. That's the kidney, isn't it? Mm. Actually, people don't stand on this, do they? <laughs> they can. Okay. Let's just show you something. So, so... This whole thing is the kidney, isn't it? You got that. Now that is the ureter, where the urine passes. Yeah. And then can you see this like rays almost? Okay. So that's where you have the ureter breaks up into the tubules. And the tubules are so tiny. And then those tubules, at the end, they've got those little things that look like flowers, the glomeruli. You remember those? Yeah. And then... Inside those glomeruli, because these are two big blood vessels, the vein and the artery, and they, just like the ureter, they split up into all these tiny things. And inside the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule, the cover bit, yeah. then you've got the yeah. little capillaries, which is the breakdown of the vessels, isn't it? Yeah. So, now why didn't you understand the podocytes? Because... It's not enough to take a microscope. You have to get an electron microscope to look at the podocytes. And they're right internal. So I'm not surprised you didn't understand the podocytes. But why is it important that we think about the podocytes? Because when those podocytes are effaced, rubbed out, then what happens is people start to leak protein in their urine. And that's what causes a whole load of problems. A whole load of problems. Because once people are leaking protein in their urine, it causes damage to the tubules, and eventually the whole kidney gets damaged. And that's why in the clinic, we're always battling, checking the protein, if they're leaking protein, probably because their podocytes are damaged, and then we're madly trying to control the blood pressure, doing anything we can to stop that protein leak. So, excellent question. In fact, what's your name? Uh, Karis. 
Karas. Okay, we'll be looking out for you, either in the medical or the nursing school. As much as we... Okay, can we have... We, we, we yeah. Can, huh? We can have... I, I have a few words. Let me give you a scenario. I'm a little bit overweight. Some say I'm fat. <laughs> high blood pressure. <laughs> I, 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 I was told I have high blood pressure. Okay. And the solution would be to lose weight, right? But let's say I have a kidney transplant in my state, as I am now. The kidney will become my kidney, right? Can I make that kidney better, which was not mine initially, by changing my lifestyle and getting fit like I was supposed to? In other words, I can influence that organ that was given to me by someone else and make it even better than it was in its initial recipient. Okay. Now that question, it's a little bit philosophical. I'm going to give it to Elder Caesar. And if he doesn't <laughs> answer it correctly, that means You're we've not been doing our work correctly. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Wait, Thank you. Our job. I hope after this answer, I will still be seen by Dr. Pupul. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, very much, Pastor. You know, I mean, I have a new kidney right now. And one thing that my surgeon told me, you know, this is your second life. I hope you will handle it with care. Mm. Okay? My, my medical condition is still there. I'm still having problems with high blood pressure. I still having problem with my, with my diabetes, which is bad combination. As, yeah. Uh, after the operation, when I felt that I'm, I'm okay, every other day, after that, every other day, I walk two hours a day. Two hours. I want to achieve at least one hour of walking, I notice, non-stop. You can reach 10,000 steps. Not walk, leisure walking, yeah? No, 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 that, don't do that. It's, it's brisk walking, actually. Something like you will get out of your breath. <laughs> you, you will something like, you know, catch your breath. And I, I don't eat rice now. I avoid rice. Yeah? Because rice is <laughs> sugar. I'm, I'm, you know what I replaced? What I replaced uh, rice? Uh, I'm eating broccoli and cauliflower. That's my <laughs> rice replacement. I steam it. I steam it. In a way that when you when you eat it, it's still crunchy. <laughs> yeah. And you can only do as much to take care of your kidney. I've learned my lesson. God is telling me, this is your second chance. Show me what you got best. So I'm, I'm doing it very well. So I avoid salt, etc., etc., what Dr. Pupula had said. Thank you so much. Uh, I know you still have... Question? Uh, very quick? Okay. Uh, mine is also a personal question. Uh, about three years ago, I was treated for a urinary tract infection, what you call UTI. And at the time, I was also doing um, a long period of prayer and fasting for spiritual reasons. And um, last year, I asked to release my medical notes for something unrelated. I asked to release my medical notes for something unrelated. And I discovered in there that I had third stage kidney disease. And I was really shocked because after my um, treatment, I've had no symptoms, no more infection, nothing. Mm -hmm. So am I still in the process of this case? third stage, or am I more prone to kidney damage, or what? So, that, so, that's, um, so that's, in a way, in this room, I'm afraid I'm not, there will be somebody that have some levels of kidney disease, mm -hmm. but people can get by, but it's what we don't want, is it to continue progressing? So stage three, two, one, often your GP, oh, 
Oh, hello. <laughs> okay. Often your GPs, your GPs will continue looking after that. But, yes, if we get infections, that can make it worse. And maybe it's difficult to answer all your question without seeing the nitty gritty. But I'll just share this with everyone so that you can know. So urinary tract infections can damage our kidneys, particularly if we get them continuously. Now, for people that like to fast, for whatever reason, maybe it's for intermittent fasting or it's, um, it's spiritual prayer, we have to be a bit careful and mindful how we do it. At least make sure we keep hydrated. Because if we get too dehydrated, then we're more likely to get issues with infection. Because when we drink clear water, it's like flushing the system through, isn't it? So that's another thing we need to remember, to keep well hydrated at all times. So if we've got chronic kidney disease, we have to reduce our salt, make sure our diabetes is controlled, make sure our hypertension is controlled, make sure we look after ourselves, make sure we get our checkups so that it doesn't progress four, five. And your elder, he answered your question. If he looks after himself, he's looking after that new kidney too. Anyway, I'm sure Nen is helping you look after you as well. Yes, yes, it's good to have a private nurse. Uh, before, before I give the mic. Um, do you know that I, until now, I'm drinking four liters? Wow. I don't know if you can do two liters. I doubt. Yeah? But me, I'm doing four liters. That's, that's why uh, I, 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 I told... I know, I, I, I just told them that it, take, it takes that lot of water to flush out. I just, like would, I just would like to share with you that we've raised 825.60 um, this afternoon. I'd like to invite our church pastor, Pastor Vili, as we give our tokens of um, kindness yes. to our guest speakers. Ladies, it's just a simple token of appreciation. And um, I would like to say a heartfelt thank you for being with us this afternoon. It is a privilege to have you. Uh, can I ask you a couple of questions? Hi. <laughs> 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 Um, are you believers? Believers, believers, believers. So I think the point is not beliefs. But I'm a believer. Uh, don't forget, I'm a pastor and a journalist, so you can't, you can't avoid the question. It's a yes or no. You know, like, like um, your, your good friend Piers Morgan, yes or no. afterwards so I better be <laughs> no I promise nobody's gonna google you okay so I'm a believer and I bring others to Christ as well <laughs> okay how about you ladies I'm a believer I'm a Catholic yes I am too good I'm asking simply because I would like pastor Campbell and myself to pray for you also how would you feel if you were honorary members of this congregation. <laughs> I mean, we are happy to accept you if you want to. <laughs> and make this your second home or third home, church, if you would. Is it too much of an ask? I'll say that I'm, I'm already a friend of your congregation. <laughs> That's good enough for me. Ladies, I would like to, to say a word of appreciation for your work. Um, you are true, true professionals, and I am going to ask God to continue giving you strength and patience to work with us. For you, Dr. Popova, I would like to say something from the bottom of my heart. 
Uh, I really appreciate your eloquence, your kindness, and I do believe that your patients get better only by talking to you. <laughs> or, or better said, by listening to you. And what I love and I appreciate most about what, everything you've said here is the fact that you focus on prevention. In other words, you were telling us that you would rather change your job had everyone in the UK been disease-free. You would happily do something else. Am I right? You, you are right. <laughs> yes, you are right. So we appreciate our church and our congregation believe in a healthy lifestyle. That's why we do our best to live healthy lifestyles. And we rallied behind Caesar when we heard about his condition. And we also believe in God's power to heal. But you are God's agents. Maybe you don't know. I don't know if you know that you are God's agents. And you may be undercover. <laughs> but um, we know you. And we want to thank you. So with your permission, Pastor Campbell uh, will say a short prayer for you. This is your home. Come back whenever you wish. You don't need an invitation. Although you will get some other invitations to come in the future. I promise you that. And uh, we are very happy to now officially be friends. <laughs> Pastor, just pray for these wonderful ladies. For all of them or for one? From, for all of them. And their team. And their clinic that they are part of. Everyone we come in contact with. For your presence, come with us. Let us pray. <clears throat> kind Father God. We thank thee that we have this meeting this afternoon. And these ladies who are servants of thine, angels, Heavenly Father, who have seen so many individuals um, get better, live a normal life. Heavenly Father, give them the strength. Give them the courage that they may continue for many years to come, even become more proficient if it's possible to heal more people from their malady, from their kidney problems. Amen. Amen. God bless you in everything you do, and um, keep up the good work. Now, I would like to say that you are also a living poster for a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> when, I, when I grow up, I would like to be like you. <laughs> <laughs> there's someone who will be kind enough to take a picture of us because I might send this to St. George's Hospital newsletter. There should be a better phone, D. Uh, Pastor, let's, ha let's take a photo, please. There should be a smoothie um, waiting for you outside. I hope they're finished now. But I appreciate everyone for coming and supporting this event. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I thank everybody. I thank our pastor. But I forget to thank my wife. I, I, I will not let this day pass. This, our journey is a love story. You single, make sure that your potential husband or wife really, uh, oh wow, is really already to not only give their hearts to you, but also their kidneys. Okay? That's why I love my wife also with all my kidneys. I have three now. I have three kidneys. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, thank you so much. Um, one of the things that we do here at Wimbledon is that we have what is called a night shelter. 
um, and it, actually we will start to prepare for it. So the folk who are parked on this side, um, we are going to have to ask you to um, give us a chance because um, I need to go out and collect things for the shelter as well. And then we need to wrap up pretty quickly. Is that okay? Thank you. <laughs>